This tragic story starts in the Caribbean island of Jamaica and ends in Toronto, Canada. For the past couple of decades, Canada has been a popular destination for Jamaicans who decided to migrate, and Toronto has been the number one city where immigrants from Jamaica settled. Dwayne Bittersing was a 13-year-old boy from Jamaica who traveled to Canada in 1991 with his siblings to live with their father, Everton Bittersing, and his wife, Elaine Bittersing. Duane had a difficult and unhappy life in Toronto, where he was abused, neglected, and isolated by his parents. He died in 1992 after allegedly falling from the balcony of the family's 22nd floor apartment. However, his death was never fully investigated nor explained. His case was overshadowed by that of his sister, Melanie Bittersing, whose body was found in a burning suitcase in 1994. This is the story of his short, tormented life, his profoundly sad demise, and the questions that remain unanswered. If you find videos like these intriguing and want to see more, please click the like button, as that really does help the channel. A Hopeful Journey to Canada Duane Bittersing was born in 1979 in Kingston, Jamaica where he lived with his mother, Opal Austin, and his sister, Melanie Bittersing. He had a close bond with his sister, who was four years his senior. He also had a half-brother, Cleon Bittersing, from a different mother, but shared the same father. In 1991, Duane's father, Everton Bittersing, who had left Jamaica years earlier, returned to visit his family. He offered to take Duane, Melanie, and Cleon to Canada with him, promising them a better life and opportunities in Toronto. Duane's mother agreed to let them go, hoping they would have a brighter future. However, Duane's new life in Canada was far from what he had hoped for. He was never enrolled in school, never allowed to leave the apartment he shared with his father, stepmother and siblings, and never got a chance to contact his mother again. He became isolated, lonely and depressed. On the flight to Toronto, their first, the children were practically blowing up with excitement of their new life. Theirs was the usual immigrant's dream. A better life, more opportunity, the big chance. With the Jamaican twist, where children are often sent to join relatives in the extended clan who are doing even marginally well in Canada or the United States. Because marginally well in any of those countries is still much better economically than it is for so many in Jamaica. However, it all went sour almost immediately. The bitter things by now had two young boys of their own, and Elaine was pregnant with a third child, a girl. In the cramped confines of that small one bedroom apartment on the 22nd floor of a closed avenue high rise came this trio of long limbed country kids from Jamaica, each with a single suitcase containing all they owned in the world. Within a week, Elaine was openly doubting that Duane was Everton's son. Duane had afro hair, she said, and it didn't look like his father. This was Duane's welcome to Canada. He was young with an open, trusting face of the boy in his passport picture. Now, his father didn't seem to want him, and his stepmother didn't appear to even like him. Soon, he was having to scrub the bathroom after using it with he and his Jamaican siblings having to use separate dishes from the precious Canadian-born children, lest their germs dirtied the other children of their father and the stepmother. Later, they were fed different, forced to eat on the floor, and eventually they were fed less and less food. Cleon's pride was deeply injured, for instance, whenever they were fed cornmeal, a food fed mostly to dogs in Jamaica. A nightmare of abuse. Duane's parents subjected him and his siblings to a catalogue of horrific abuse that lasted for years. They were beaten and burnt with an iron, their ear was cut, and they were locked in a closet or on a balcony for days without food or water, 
They were forced to sleep on the floor or in a bathtub filled with water, and they were denied all medical care. Additionally, the children were also made to do all the household chores while the couple treated their biological son like royalty. Duane was especially targeted by his parents because they believed he was not Everton's biological son. They made him take a DNA test which proved Everton was his father, but still they treated him as an outsider and a burden. They also cruelly blamed him for Melanie's injuries which they themselves inflicted on her as part of their torture. Duane endured the abuse silently, hoping that one day he would escape or be rescued. He wrote letters to his mother in Jamaica but never got a chance to mail them. He also kept a diary where he expressed his feelings and the dreams. He wrote that he wanted to go back to Jamaica to see his mother again. None of the three ever walked through the doors of a school building, though all had gone to school in Jamaica and had big plans for their future. Cleon was a gifted runner and dreamt of competing in the Olympics. Melanie wanted to be a nurse, and Duane, as befits a child who could dazzle and hold a room, wanted to be a singer. Even with his father and stepmother, Duane managed to wangle a little freedom certainly more than Melanie ever could. Cleon had the most, but never felt free. He said Everton got him a pager, showed him how and where to sell crack cocaine, and often watched him from the balcony as he headed out on his bicycle to deal. All the money made was turned over to Everton. Melanie had the least freedom of movement. She was never allowed out of the apartment unless Everton or Elaine was with her and she was also the chief caregiver of the couple's baby daughter. When the only regular visitor to the apartment, a friend of Everton's came over, Melanie was usually stuffed into a closet and hidden from sight. The few people outside of the family who ever clamped eyes on her, such as Ava Stewart, who knew Opal and her kids from Jamaica but now lived in Toronto, never saw her without the baby on her lap and usually from a distance. Yet Duane, also known as Sabo, somehow convinced Everton and Elaine to let him work as a paper boy for the Toronto Sunday Sun. Capable boy that he was, Sabo managed to track down Ava Stewart and began showing up occasionally to visit her. Then Ava, now 44, had left her grandmother's and moved out on her own, far away from the Parkdale area in the western downtown area of the city where the Bidersings lived. Somehow, the ingenious Sabo found her, and one Sunday in June of 1992, he turned up. Stuart remembered the visit because her sister and a girlfriend of theirs from Jamaica were over. Her basement apartment suddenly filled with the laughter and the noise Sabo always brought. Stuart made them all dinner, and Sabo asked if he could sleep over, and she said sure, but call your father and let him know. She didn't think that he had. We were happy, Stuart said of that night. We were having fun. E. Sabo was playing, talkative as usual. She slept on the sofa bed in the living room, giving up her bed for her guests. The next morning, she said, she was awakened by a knock on the door. It was Everton. He wanted to know if Sabo was there. He was sleeping. So she patted him on the shoulder to wake him up and told him, your dad's here. He jumped out of his sleep and the first thing that came out of his mouth was, he's gonna kill me. And then the whole morning was chaos. Ava Stewart had difficulty remembering the details of what Sabo said that day. It was 20 years earlier, after all. But she and the other two women realized that something was going on, because the boy was frightened. Sabo went with Everton. Of course, Stuart could hardly stop him. But the same day, Everton was knocking at her door again, demanding to know what Sabo discussed with her. He wanted her to tell him everything that Sabo had talked about with her. Ava said Sabo never told her anything the night before, so she couldn't tell him Everton anything. Everton, she said, wasn't happy. He was angry, as he wanted her to give him information and she didn't have any information to give to him. Ava was bewildered, couldn't figure out what was going on, but sometime later she got a call from her mother in Jamaica, 
and she was asking, is it true? Is it true? And Opal, Sabo's mother, was in the background crying and saying that Sabo was dead. So Ava called Everton and told him what she had heard. He confirmed it. Sabo was dead. Or as Stewart told the Toronto police when they interviewed her almost two weeks later, Everton replied, yes, everything's alright, but he's dead. The details of the boy's death remained murky, as always they are, given the circumstances. But what is clear is that the same day Sabo went back home to Parkdale with his father, apparently frightened out of his skin, Sabo either jumped from the balcony, slipped trying to get onto the neighboring one, or somehow went over the railing. His body was discovered on the front lawn below. Police were dispatched, obviously, with Kim Carr, now retired from the force but then a 14 division detective in charge, the building superintendent identified the boy's apartment and they headed up to suite 2203. Cleon answered the door. Only E, Melanie and the baby were there, Everton and Elaine having left the apartment. Cleon told them that Sabo had been acting up. He was jealous of the attention Melanie got and that he had beaten Melanie up the day before. He said that after Everton brought Sabo home, Sabo didn't seem upset. Cleon said that his parents called him into the bedroom and then they heard the balcony door open and he came out and saw him standing on the railing and he jumped. Man, he just jumped, Cleon said. Sabo, meanwhile, was pronounced dead at St. Joseph's Hospital. Everton called from a phone booth, Officer Carr said, and told him he knew what had happened, but could not deal with it yet, as his wife was screaming, crying, trembling, and he had to deal with her first. In the apartment, Constables Irene Osar and Joy Zentner were interviewing Melanie, Osar noted an astonishing array of injuries on the girl's body, then just 15 years old. Welts and scratches covered her arms and legs. There were welts on her stomach, a cut to her head, a swollen nose and swollen ankle and hand. Osar's unwritten notes of the girl's injuries entered at the preliminary hearing run to two full pages. From her home in a poor Kingston ghetto. Opal Austin, a roadside vendor of cigarettes and sweets, was virtually without resources. She had no phone, no money, and no power. But she had one friend who knew someone who knew someone. And when Sabo died, she begged that person for help. Ultimately, the Jamaican government wrote her a letter dated June 17, 1993 smack in the middle of the deaths of the two children she had sent to Canada. Signed on behalf of the Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Foreign Trade, the letter represented that the Jamaican consulate in Toronto had contacted Melanie and were satisfied that she was doing well. She was scheduled to begin school in September of that year, but was currently staying home with her younger brother and sister. In fact, Melanie had two younger half-brothers and a half-sister. The consulate also carried out investigations into the death of Duane Bittersing through interviews with official sources and, of course, Everton Bittersing. The father, the letter said, reported that Duane was very daring since he arrived in Canada and said that after being brought home following his adventure at Ava Stewart's, he had gotten up suddenly, ran to the balcony, and jumped without warning or reason. The police and the coroner investigated. The consulate reported, but there was no indication of him being pushed. Oh, and except for Duane's death, the letter said that the consulate found that Melanie seems to be quite happy. Imagine that. The bottom line is that in June of 1992, Two years and three months before the bits and pieces of her own ruined body were found in a touched suitcase, Melanie Bidersing was already so badly hurt that her injuries took two pages to detail. Could she have been saved if police had called in a child welfare agency or taken her to a hospital that night where a nurse might have notified children's aid? Or if someone in authority had not found Everton Bidersing to be such a reliable historian? Perhaps she could have been, 
but child welfare agencies sometimes drop the ball too and there is no guarantee that they would have followed through. But what is certain is that the abuse that was plain even in 1992 grew much worse and Melanie endured it for 27 more months. When in 2011, Elaine Bittersing, in a sort of self-serving quasi-confession, told her pastor that the girl in the suitcase was her husband's daughter and the pastor reported it, the Toronto police were finally able to identify the girl and began investigating Melanie's death. Duane's case was reopened as part of the investigation into Melanie's murder, but no new evidence or charges were brought forward. Everton and Elaine were both found guilty of murdering Melanie and sentenced to life in prison. However, they were never held accountable for Duane's demise or the abuse they inflicted on him and his siblings. There were so many inconsistencies and gaps in the investigation that raised doubts about the official verdict. For example, the police found the welts and bruises all over Melanie's body when they interviewed her about Duane's death. She told them that Duane had beaten her because he was angry that she was getting more attention than him. Everton and Elaine supported this claim and told the police that Duane was violent and suicidal. However, the police did not contact the Children's Aid Society nor follow up on Melanie's injuries. Another example is that the police did not interview any of the neighbors or witnesses who saw or heard anything related to Duane's death. Some of them reported hearing screams and the thuds from the apartment before Duane fell. Others reported seeing Everton carrying a large suitcase out of the apartment shortly after Duane fell. Nevertheless, none of these accounts were recorded or investigated by the police. A third example is that the police did not conduct an autopsy on Duane's body or collect any forensic evidence from the scene. They relied on a visual examination by a coroner, who concluded that Duane died from multiple injuries due to falling from a height. This examination did not rule out any other possible causes of death or injuries prior to falling. Duane Bittersing's tragic story is a chilling reminder of the profound failures within the child protection system and law enforcement. His life was marked by unimaginable cruelty, abuse, and isolation. His untimely death remains shrouded in mystery, overshadowed by the horrific fate of his sister, Melanie. The questions that persist around Duane's case highlight the need for a thorough and unrelenting commitment to investigating and preventing child abuse. As we reflect on this disturbing tale, let it serve as a call to action for every one of us to be vigilant in the protection of the most vulnerable among us, ensuring that no child suffers in silence. If you found this video intriguing or informative, please give it a thumbs up. Also remember you can subscribe to the channel by clicking the subscribe button. Until we meet again here on Elite Jamaica, just want to say y'all stay safe and thank you for watching. Elite Jamaica don't forget to drop a like and a comment. Don't forget to subscribe.